in our dream, we create a docile man who is willing to bend to our every whim and need. You're like, that's the paper? Like this is the, this is the white paper of the general education board. Yeah, that's crazy. They hide nothing. So I use the example of a mortgage so people can understand. Maybe you've been working for five, 10 years and you've saved up 50,000 euros, dollars, pounds, wherever you're watching. That represents at that point, your life savings. But that life savings cannot buy you a home. There's no way in the world. The only way you can buy a home is if you take that 50,000 pounds to a bank and deposit that with the bank. They take it from you. And then they will give you the other 200,000 euros that you need to buy the house. But that 200,000 euros, they just create. That's just numbers in a system that they then deposit to your account. And they're gonna charge you interest on it. So they're charging you interest on money that didn't even exist and it cost them nothing to create. It does not represent any work or value of anybody else. It's not as if they took that from somebody else's account and put it into yours, and they're using that to create profit for the bank and for their customers. They print the money, the deposit is the loan, you use that, and then you pay them back, you three. Over the next 25 years, you're completely handcuffed. What's the second best? There is no second best. There is no second best crypto asset. There's a crypto asset, it's called Bitcoin, right? Right? There is no second best. Yeah, we can go. Yeah. All right. What are we talking about? Uh, Bitcoin? Bitcoin, <laughs> as usual. Yeah. I, I wanted to, because the last time we didn't have time to talk about this, uh, like you, your article that you, you did uh, on Consensus Network yeah. about usury and how it affects the world and how it was uh, spotted by religious and how they, yeah, they write about it, how they feel about it. And I wanted to have your, your look on it yeah. and also maybe explain to the, the audience what is usury, yeah. how does it uh, work today, yeah. the evolution. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say for anybody uh, watching this that wants to learn more about it, um, The Fiat Standard by Saifedean is a, a really good book to, to like take you through. And reading that just, you know, it, un, even though like you and I, we've been studying Bitcoin for a long time, you come up against some of these resources and you read them and it just redefines your mind and starts, you know, really peeling back the onion of, of what we what we live in under. And it was that book and then um, specifically another book and a shout out to a friend of mine, Sir Badminton of Bitcoin at Hodler Than Thou. Uh, we have a, a penchant for like lesser read books. And he found this one called Red Symphony. And he's like, Dan, you got to read this book. And in fact, it's not a book in the strictest sense. It's a transcript of a conversation that took place in 1938 between uh, Stalin, we're in his building now, like that's weird. <laughs> we're talking about this, weird. So yeah. Stalin's top NKVD agent was interrogating the, uh, the Russian ambassador to France. And they had the conversation in French and they had a doctor there that was working under duress for the NKVD because he was a specialist in uh, biochemical uh, manipulation. And he had been party to a lot of other torture sessions where he'd given people lots of different drugs and chemicals to get them in a state of like extracting as much information out of them as they possibly could for Stalin to try and... Um, and and it, this all led to the show trials where a lot of people were publicly hanged and shamed and killed um, for, you know, resisting against like the regime. So they had this guy, Rakovsky, and he was being interviewed and Landowski, the doctor, uh, the, the interview all took place in French. They could all speak French perfectly. And when you read the book, you'll understand the level of intellect as well that we're talking about. Because the language, when I was reading it, uh, you know, translated into English, you can, you can tell that the three people having this conversation are of a level of intellect, you know, very, very high intellect. And uh, the doctor had to uh, translate the conversation that was recorded for Stalin into Russian so Stalin could read the information for himself. He kept copies himself, and these copies were found on his dead body a decade or so later. But it, it wasn't alone. It wasn't supposed to, to become public. No, no, no. It was not supposed to become public at all. It was for the NKVD agent's eyes and Stalin's eyes only. Um, 
and in uh, in the event of uh, after his death and uh, deliberation of a lot of the, the camps and the gulags and whatever else in, in Russia, a Spanish soldier found the body of this particular doctor and found all these papers and took the papers and got them back to Spain where, where an expert had them translated and um, voila, we have this information. It's the most crucial information I think a lot of Bitcoiners are missing. Uh, well, public in general are missing because like, it, it's incredible. And he talks about um, usury in particular. He's like, uh, and he, he looks at all of the religions, like every single religion, uh, you know, has a very dim view on the practice of usury. And so what is usury? Usury is the... Uh, is making money out of money, i.e. charging high interest rates uh, or unfair interest rates on money loaned to people in need. And, you know, it's in the Bible, it's in all of the, uh, the scriptures, it's in the Quran. This is why we have Sharia law or Haram. Um, you know, you're not allowed to make money from money. Even Buddha has a quote um, talking about this as well. And so I talk about this in the piece. And when you realize uh, how illegal that is, how immoral that is, how wrong that is, and you compare that to modern day, what we live under right now, this fiat system, where usury is being applied to all of us, whether you've ever applied for a, a home loan, uh, an extension on your house loan, a holiday loan, a car loan, you want to buy some new appliances for your house, you get that on finance. All of this stuff is pure usury because the money that is being given, you, given to you in the first place has been counterfeited by the banks. It's been legally counterfeited. So if an individual goes to a bank, says, I need a loan. So I use the example of a mortgage so people can understand Maybe you've been working for five, 10 years and you've saved up 50,000 euros, dollars, pounds, wherever you're watching. That represents at that point your life savings, but that life savings cannot buy you a home. There's no way in the world. The only way you can buy a home is if you take that 50,000 pounds to a bank and deposit that with the bank. They take it from you and then they will give you the other 200,000 euros that you need to buy the house. But that 200,000 euros, they just create. That's just numbers in a system that they then deposit to your account. And they're going to charge you interest on it. So they're charging you interest on money that didn't even exist and it cost them nothing to create. It does not represent any work or value of anybody else. It's not as if they took that from somebody else's account and put it into yours. And they're using that to um, you know, create profit for the bank and for their customers. They print the money. The deposit is the loan. You use that and then you pay them back usury. Over the next 25 years, you're completely handcuffed. And not only that, your 50,000 euros that you use the deposit, that's gone. That's wiped off the table, completely gone. You're starting a game from zero. And you believe, this is the trick of it, you believe then that the house is yours, the real estate is yours, where it is not because you are paying this usurious amount back to the bank over the next 25 years, whatever it is, 30 years. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's highly illegal. And there was a case in the US where it's called the, um, the Credit River case, if I'm not mistaken. And I think it was in the state of Minneapolis or Minnesota, uh, where the bank foreclosed on a customer and said, you got to give us the house back because you're not paying us your mortgage. Mm. He was a lawyer, this guy, and he, basically defended himself saying, well, in fact, it was criminal, the money that you used and counterfeited to help uh, to, to deposit into my bank account didn't exist in the first place. Therefore, what you're doing is usurious. That is illegal. He won the case mm -hmm. until, until they appealed. And then all of a sudden, the judge that ruled in favor of the guy that won the case had a boating accident all by himself one day on a fishing trip. Like, you can't make this stuff up. And there are books about that specific case as well. So, yeah, that's, um, that's what usury is. Uh, charging unfair, exorbitant amounts on money lent to other people. Okay. And this is the world in which we live today. Everywhere.
every single one of us. But those people are not uh, responsible for the... If you're trying to borrow money, I, I mean, are you not re responsible to taking on a higher interest rate that is possible or that you, you should or... Right, okay. So again, you, it's your own uh, free will. Right, okay. So yeah, what, what you're saying is it should be on the individual to, to yeah. be more careful with their money, right? Yeah. And, and not fall into this trap and not yeah. be... Yeah, exactly. exactly. 100% it should be. But unfortunately, the, the world in which we live today, people's education of this is just zero. Okay. A lot of people don't, never heard the word usury before. And people are desperate because they just want to get on the property ladder because they've been brainwashed into believing that the only thing that's going to be a store of value for you is to, you've got to have your own property, bricks and mortar. That's what you have to do. We've been tricked into believing that um, real estate, rather than just being a consumer good, which is all it is, it should just be shelter for you and your family and your home, uh, has been turned into a capital good and a place where you are, you know, you're tricked in believing like this is going to go up in value forever. And what people don't understand is the only reason that the sticker price of that house that's going up in value is, it's not that the house is going up in value, it's that your purchasing power is being debased. Hmm. And it's being debased by inflation, perpetual inflation, because when you take out that loan, you are inflating the monetary supply because you've now just greenlit the bank to print that 200,000 euros into your bank account, or you've greenlit the bank to print that 50,000 euros into your bank account for the new car that you want, or the, you know, the extension on your home, or the holiday, everything like we were talking about. So if you, if you now like, like extend that out onto a global perspective, how many, how many, how many millions of dollars every second of every day are being deposited into people's bank accounts under the guise of a loan? Every single time somebody does that, that increases the monetary base and that devalues the purchasing power of our neighbors and of our friends and of our family around us. But people are getting caught up in this zero sum game and they're running a thousand miles an hour on a hamster wheel and they don't have time. They've got the blinkers on mm. and it's, well, how else am I going to get a house? They don't. So it's a kind of giant race where the, the guy that is like able to, to borrow the most get uh, on the, the highest place uh, yep. yeah absolutely the, it, exactly it, the, the more money the, and sailors talked about this actually on a podcast with Saifedean that's that's the way to win the fiat system borrow as much as you can and before anybody else because everything else is going to go up in value because the purchasing power of everybody else's euros dollars yen whatever currency is slowly getting debased as more money enters into the system. And do you separate um, loans that are done with uh, healthy currency, like hard currency, and loans that are done on those fake money uh, that we call fiat? <laughs> uh, or is it for, the, for both the same issue? Because in a religion, they say it's the same. Like every time you charge interest, Yep. It's a uh, halam or those kind of thing. Yes. So yep. is there a separation for you or is it all... Uh, so this is... Stop uh, it? I, I would point you towards um, Guy Swan, the, um, the Bitcoin Audible podcast. Yeah, I listened to the right one. So, and I think this is probably where your, your question is yeah. stemming from. So Guy did a, gr a great Guy's take after reading the piece. Mm -hmm. He was very, very generous. He read the piece. I was very humbled that um, he read about it and uh, it intrigued him. And he spent about another 20 minutes afterwards trying to like unpack his thoughts about it because yes, on, on one side, it's completely wrong. Like you shouldn't do this. But on the other side, the capitalist free market argument is if you have an asset and you've you know, stored it and you've taken care of it and you want to use that asset to um, you know, throw off some kind of cash flow against it, is there anything wrong with that? Um, yes, the religions would say 100%, you should never do that. Uh, I, and I'm not exactly sure where I stand on it because, you know, if you enter into the agreement with free will, so this is where fear, it can never work because they're just printing the money, it's counterfeit, it's fake. Like, they, they, that's usury. Whereas if somebody comes to you, you're a Bitcoiner, you've got some Bitcoin, I can, they want to, uh, you, you want to, um, have access to a different capital market, that person will access to holding some Bitcoin. If you enter into that together, 
uh, and you might even use like a, an intermediary to, to write a contract and do that, then I, I don't see why that would be a problem between those two individuals. Um, so yeah, uh, it's not that clear cut. It's, it's, a certain, it's certainly an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic that's starting to play out in Bitcoin as Bitcoin starts financializing. And uh, we have different products out there. We have Debify and we have Ledin. We've had some that have gone spectacularly bankrupt, like uh, Celsius and BlockFi. That uh, you know, where does the yield come from? So I don't want people getting you know caught up in that. So you got to go in eyes wide open and have an understanding of what interest is, what usury is, what uh, what loans are, um, and be very very careful with it, and be very very careful with your Bitcoin because loaning that out. Yeah. For what, yeah, you yeah. know, there's, you do then stand the risk of never getting that back because it is, it is already to many of us and uh, will become the most desirable asset to hold you know, on this planet. Hmm. Yeah. And I had the, this discussion uh, one day with one guy, uh, we did an interview with him. And, um, he was explaining that it will be a little bit complicated in English. Yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> That the the fiat money could be explained with a, an accountability perspective, that it wasn't that much fake, because whenever you you lend money uh, and you are in the bank and you you're making yeah you you lending money to people, you, you need to to check if the the guy have the the capital behind it, mm -hmm. so. It's just accountability, a new accountability line. But the, for him, like the, the main issue uh, with our banking system wasn't the fact that we're creating money out of thin air, but more the liquidity issue and the mismanaging of uh, the banking system and the fact that after we are uh, bailing them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that uh, uh, originally, it was more a uh, case against the, um, the full reserve system uh, because there is many Bitcoiners now that are uh, pro 100% uh, reserve for the bank. And he was saying that it doesn't make really sense because if we keep into the equation the fact that we are looking at the collateral of the, the people that are borrowing, in fact, the bank have the, the money behind it. Just because there is the legal system and everything that uh, can impose the the money to be taken from the individual, so that there wasn't that much issue on that perspective on the fact that you can lend some money uh, that doesn't really exist, but that exists because it's uh, it's belong to the people that are belong, uh, borrowing. I don't know if it's clear enough. I, I think I, I think I get what you're saying. So if if a bank was fully 100% reserved. Would it? Would they be able to loan out, and would that be viewed differently? Like, yeah, in that kind of scenario, I'm, I'm not sure on this thing. After uh, I need to to clear my mind on it. Yeah, but uh, who were yeah. you speaking to? Anyone I know? Uh, no, no, it's a French guy. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. It's not really. Yeah, it's a little bit inside the Bitcoin space, but it's not uh, speaking about it that much. Right. What one one point on that? Because uh, Caitlin Long has been trying to launch her bank in. Um, Custodia in, in the US. And there was another bank called Narrow Bank that tried to launch in the US as well. And they were going to be 100% full reserve. Mm. Totally. They can't get a banking license. Yeah, I don't understand for that. Yeah. Well, because the, the cartel, that's not the way you play their game. If you want a banking license, you have to go to the Federal Reserve and they will only give you a banking license if you're going to fractionally reserve. There's no way in the world they're going to give you a banking license because two cases now where all of the documentation has been submitted, perfectly good, perfectly well uh, run companies, followed all the, you know, stack of paper. There's pictures of Caitlin showing the, the paper that they've all gone through all of the process to try and get a banking license so they can serve customers in a fashion that they believe to be ethical and moral by having 100% proof of reserves and run loans off of that, against that, against that collateral with an, you know, a pre-agreed um, interest rate. So you get them in with eyes wide open and you know that you know, if that bank fails, 
maybe they don't get bailed out because so it doesn't matter because they can't get in the game. They're not welcome to the table. You only get to like issue loans in the US and the UK and France, wherever else, if you play by the current licensing terms and agreements, and that is you have to run a fractional reserve operation. Yeah. But I, I don't know what's the point, or the point of doing this. What do they get from you as a bank to, to become part of this uh, cartel, as you said? Well, what's, what's the point of uh, pushing you to have a fractional reserve? Like to have the, the hand on you yeah. after? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the more control and, you know, a, a wider. So um, if you were to go and approach and you did say, yeah, we're going to fraction reserve, no problem, blah, blah, blah. Great, here's your banking license. It's, um, it's more advantageous to uh, the central bank then because then they have an extra, um, like, uh, like the octopus, right, with the arm. They have an extra arm in which to funnel money throughout into the economic system when they perform quantitative easing, for example. Mm. Okay. So when they perform quantitative easing, that money has to get into the system somehow. So their system, their delivery system are these banks, these licensed banks. And so I think in the UK, it's anywhere between 15 and 20, for example. I don't know the numbers in France, but you know that Crédit Agricole, BMP, um, I, I can't think of yeah, any other, yeah, yeah. Crédit Lyonnais. Right. Um, yeah. So maybe there's 10 to 15 there yeah. as well. But they, they are like the licensed money lenders of, the, um, of the, the Bank of France, European Central Bank, whatever. Mm. So when that money starts hitting, let's say, ECB prints, quantitative easing for our safety, 100 billion euros into the, um, into the economy to stimulate the economy, to get people jobs, you know, all of the usual nonsense that Lagarde would say to brainwash people into thinking they're doing a good thing. How does that money get into the system? Well, that money is just basically digits at the ECB, then X will be placed at this bank, this bank, this bank, this bank, this bank, this bank, this bank. That bank then calls up their AAA rated customers and say, would you like to take a loan at 0.5% because you're Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, whatever, and you are AAA and it's very low risk for the bank? And the bank know that they're going to get that half percent. That goes to the AAA customers, then the A, then the B, then the C. Then when it gets finally to the plebs, what's left, it's like, oh, yeah, would you like a new mortgage? But these mortgage rates are now four and a half, five percent instead of the half percent that the Googles and everyone else was getting this fresh money at. And what are they doing with that fresh money? What they've been doing recently, the last decade, is just buying back their own uh, stock. So they perform a share buyback. That raises the price of the stock market. You can't get any access to the freshly printed money because it's all swelling around up here. This is the Cantillon effect, as um, you've already, you know, I'm sure you've read about this. French-Irish economist. And French-Irish? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Richard Cantillon. Cantillon. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't know he was uh, Irish. Yes, that's why. Yeah, um, I believe so. I believe he was uh, a mix of French-Irish. Okay. So this is how all of this money gets uh, dribbled down into the economy. And um, with, without there being any new goods or services, there is more money now chasing the same amount of goods and services, which just naturally rise to, my, to meet the, 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 the new um, money that's in the system. Um, it's, so back to our example of if a bank was to run 100% fully reserved, like, you know, they would take that fresh money and they would account for that and they would say, well, here's the money that we've just received out of nowhere from you know, this central bank. We can now loan against it. But what the central bank wants is for that money to be fractionally reserved against, not held. Because the more money that keeps sloshing around the system is better for those at the top because the prices of assets, that's stocks, um, real estate, perfect example, just goes up on paper because everything is getting devalued. The purchasing power of everybody, uh, everybody else's euros and dollars is just getting lower and lower. Okay. But don't you think that um, if there was one bank doing this, like 100% reserve, do, do the client will choose this one? 
Then because again, if comes there is the... another one that uh, doesn't do like uh, the usual bank, yeah, they will um, issue a lending uh, a possibility, a better lending possibility with a lower ra uh, rate. Because right. for full reserve, you will get higher rates. Yeah. So Th then again, comes how do you back incentive to... people to come? People, people just look at sticker prices, don't they? They, they just look at the when they're shopping around for loans and uh, or anything. They're looking for what's the cheapest. What's the best deal? Uh, so yeah, somebody might be offering you three and a half percent on a loan from a fractionally reserved like bucket shop, or four and a half percent on a loan from a fully reserved, fully transparent bank. You and I know my money is going to be, you know, I'm going to be safer going with this, but I'm going to pay more. Most people just going to the whatever's cheapest. Uh, so yeah, I, okay. and they can charge less and less. They, they can just keep chopping each other. Um, because they're, they're just printing cash whenever they want it. Like uh, if people are walking in and asking for 200,000 euro dollar loans, I'm like, yeah, okay, let's go. They just, they're not taking it out of an existing reserve. It's just being added to the bank deposit hmm. of the customer. So, so I don't see the, the risk for the, the Federal Reserve or the SEC. I don't know which um, entity deliver the, the authorization, but to, to let a bank to do full reserve when for me the incentive are not mm -hmm. there for the, the customer to go uh, to a full reserve. Uh, yeah, especially when uh, everything run on this standard and uh, that we know that there will be bailout, uh, you, there is no risk, uh, just the inflation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't yeah. know why they won't license fully reserved because, you know, what is the risk for them? Like, why would they not allow that game at the table? Probably, they, they, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Okay. I can't get inside a psychopath's head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there is many subjects. Um, are you on something new today? Um, like, do, do you have some uh, obsession that you want to share? It's always, oh, uh, there's, there's always <laughs> too many. <laughs> there's always obsessions when when you start going um, down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. There, uh, you know, we, we've talked about um, homeschooling before, hmm. unschooling, getting out of that um, that system, uh, looking uh, very closely at the education system and how that was formed and why it was formed. Uh, a lot of people are aware of like the um, the way the Federal Reserve was formed. There was a secret meeting in 1910 on Jekyll Island. Uh, well, in fact. In 1902, they'd already had a secret meeting, same, same group of characters, to form the General Education Board. So they captured the education system, then they captured the money system, then they captured the health system. Um, so when you start looking at all of that, you're like, oh my God. Um, that's, that's one thing that uh, I've looked very, very closely at. Uh, the, the latest thing I think you've probably seen me tweeting a little bit about recently is um, the, the geoengineering yeah. uh, that's really coming to light now. And people are just fully outright openly admitting is like yeah we we see clouds all the time yeah we spray stuff in the air all the time you know and the, the storms in dubai um i'm sure there's many conspiracy theorists out there saying oh what the hell he, he's or, or pointing fingers oh no all these conspiracy theorists it's like you know it's it's proven that private companies are getting funding under the grift of climate change to spray chemicals directly into the air or directly into the clouds to brighten the clouds using silver iodide. Mm. They call it, some people call it chemtrails because that's a, a term I believe that's been planted to cancel people. When you actually look into like the, the scientific research, in those circles it's called solar radiation modification. And the idea being you spray a mix of silver iodide and goodness knows whatever else up into the sky, uh, which will slowly spread and uh, create a reflective barrier to reflect some of the, uh, the sun's rays to keep the planet from overheating because we're all going to fall out of the sky and die because, you know, the global temperatures have raised hmm. half or one and a half percent, whatever it is. And because we have this pledge this ridiculous pledge being made by countries around the world, you know, net zero by 2030 and whatever else, like complete and utter, it's crazy. Um, there's a lot of funding out there, government funding 
for these private companies to tap into. So when you just follow the incentive structure, when you just look back and think, right, okay, are they, are they spraying stuff into the air? Yes, they are, because there are private companies that talk about it openly. There's a company called Making Sunsets. There's a company called Rainmaker. There's a company called Silver Lining. Private companies that are getting funding, whether it's private equity funding or whether it's um, direct government funding, uh, to do these experiments. And we're having disastrous consequences and have done for decades because it's come to light now in 1952 in a town in Linmouth, uh, called Linmouth in Devon, was completely... I mean, after utter catastrophe after the RAF had been secretly seeding the clouds above their head in geoengineering weather experiment. This is all fully documented now, released UK government official papers. What happened in Dubai last week? You know, th this, isn't, this isn't by chance. Mm -hmm. And Dubai have even got a video showing their meteor... meteor I can't even say the word. They're, they're weather people. Um, talking about like the, the investment that they've made into this cloud seeding project, um, you know, across that part of the world, it, it's documented in China, in Singapore, where they did it as well. They still do it. Uh, this is playing God, and like people are, like, you, you, <laughs> you've got these VCs who are talking about, like, this is the, the narrative they're coming up with. We need to start. Um, really looking into this technology and playing around with this technology, testing here on planet Earth so we can go and terraform Mars. Man, what are you saying? Like, people in Dubai have lost everything. People have died across Oman and all of that area because of a huge storm, which, here's the thing, we'll never be able to prove was direct but we know for sure that they do do this practice. So that thing has come across my uh, radar at the moment, and I've been looking into that. And um, the more you look into it, the more scary it gets because people are willing to play God. Mm. And, and was it hide or was it like in kind of plain sight, but without talking uh, it's, I, in, I it's in plain sight because they have videos of them showing like the technology. There's, um, there's a, a, a reporter called Ginger Lee, I think, in the US. who's done a whole documentary on it, you know, talking, talking about it. There's a guy who's been on uh, Pomp's podcast um, from Rainmaker, Augustus Dicko or something like that. I can't remember his exact name. Talking about it openly, what they do with drones, flying drones up into clouds to seed them with silver iodide. No citizen knows this is actually happening or would have voted for it. But these, these guys are doing it. And I think there needs to be a full-on open discussion without people pointing and saying, oh, look, yeah, they're, they're, they think they're spraying stuff in the sky, they're chemtrailers and all this kind of stuff. Let's have a discussion. Like geoengineering, is that a good idea or a bad idea? And I think most people, if they were given the option, hey, should private companies be spraying stuff into our clouds above our heads? Hands up. I'm pretty sure most people are going to, no, I don't think so. I don't think that's a great idea. Yeah, for sure. And on the education side, you, you did some more research also. Um, but what did you find out? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that one is so deep. Um, but basically, uh, the education system uh, in, in the U.S., because that was a new country, right? Uh, the education system already in um, across Prussia, <clears throat> Prussia, France, and England uh, was all very well uh, structured in place for many years to create basically workers and military. Uh, the U.S. Um, when when people were fleeing other parts of Europe to get to the U.S. for freedom, for more autonomy. Uh, that country was just like an open mess of different uh, religions, different cultures, different countries, uh, different um, cultures, everything, right? A big uh, McDonald's. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come as you are. All right. It was completely like a total, there was no order. Anarchy, I suppose. Mm. But that's a great breeding ground for people who have these 
uh, sociopathic tendencies to try and capture that and like, how do we control this and mm -hmm. bring this to order and what's our idea of order and what's our dream of order. And that's when you start looking into the general education board and how they came to be and uh, characters such as Horace Mann, who went across to Prussia um, to study that system in the late 1800s uh, and come back and started pushing this idea of this is how we get control. This is what we need to do. This is how we bring order. This is how we bring um, uh, how we create a, uh, a more docile, uh, easier to control society. And um, yeah, that's what the education system was actually put in place to do. It was, it was never about our education. And it was funded by um, J.D. Rockefeller in a secret meeting in 1902. And the General Education Board was, um, yeah, th that's when it first came to be. He put in, in charge of that was a guy called Frederick T. Gates. Is there any documents, uh, books that we can uh, oh, yeah. look at? Oh. In fact, the quickest way to do it is just go to the General Education Board Wikipedia page. It's crazy. Uh, oh. Also, when I do research, I just saw it's on Wikipedia. Yep. Uh, Everything is like free to be seen and uh, yep. like nobody look at it. And no, nobody look at it. And from that, you can go straight to their own landing page. And it's very interesting to go, or you can just go find their official papers, which are even listed on the Wikipedia page or their, uh, uh, or their actual website. It's called the, um, the School of Tomorrow. And it outlines the philosophy of the General Education Board, which was written by Gates. No, re no, no relation to, to Bill. To this Gates. No. Uh, not that I found yet. Um, and the philosophy is shocking. You, you just have to uh, read the first few sentences of their philosophy, of their mission statement of what the General Education Board is for. And it was, uh, I, I, I can't do it off the top of my head, but it's basically along the lines of, in our dream, we create a, um, a docile man who is willing to bend to every our every whim and need. Like, that's the paper? Like this is the this is the white paper of the General Education Board. Man, that's crazy. They hide nothing. It's all out there. And we still, just have to find it. Yeah? Still out there. It's still out there. You're, you're one click check. away. <laughs> you're one click away from finding the general education. All you have to do, General Education Board, Wikipedia, scroll halfway down the page to the history or philosophy, and you're like, okay. I'm up to speed. Because it's still, a, it's not public, it's a private entity. The General Education Board? Yeah. Um, Who runs was, that and what is the, the relationship with uh, like the government and like the, oh, completely the main education? Uh, yeah, uh, t program. totally private, totally private. Um, okay. Yeah, self-owned institution. But they are lobbying? at the, the public well, level to, to change the, the I, don't, I don't see the, the, the interaction. The, the lobbying um, happens as, um, it's, more, it's more sneaky than that because what they started doing was, um, because Gates, who was put in, touch, uh, in charge of this, was um, the head of like Rockefeller's philanthropic um, endeavors. And that's where like universities started popping up, right? Uh, and that's why a lot of universities are, um, directly linked with a lot of the uh, the family names like Rhodes, uh, uh, Carnegie, uh, Peabody. Um, God, there's so many. Um, Rockefeller, obviously. Certain universities have um, direct links to these people. Um, and the way that the universities were, were set up was through um, uh, endowments. When you say somebody sends a million dollars to one of these universities, that million dollars, because it's philanthropic, is a tax write-off, it's mm. untaxable. But now that institution has the million dollars, you're basically funding, that. you don't need the lobbying. You don't need to lobby anything because you've just given them the million dollars. Okay, here's a million dollars on the basis that, can you please study this? Mm. Because we need research on that. But we also need certain results that point to certain, it's so, Again, Seyfedean talks about this at length in the Fiat Standard, about the uh, academic process, the way it works, because he's seen it firsthand. He was a professor at these universities. He sees how the funding comes in, where it goes, and why it goes. 
And, uh, you know, I was talking to Monica Arvey, uh, Arvey's wife. She was talking about when she was going to get a PhD in psychology uh, or science of psychology, one, one of the two. When you sign up for the course, there's a hundred subjects you have to choose like, okay, what you like, what are you going to study? So that, well, that, none of them. I'm going to like, no, no, no. You have to study one of these and you have to like research one of these. Well, well, that's not science. Like, you know, no, but so you see like the grant money comes in with the stipulation that you have to do this and the grant money is offset in tax. It, it's just the whole thing's a clusterfuck. And co to come back to like the geoengineering thing, Harvard, just recently, Harvard, just two weeks ago, three weeks ago, they cancelled a geoengineering project called uh, Scope X. Tens of millions of dollars had gone into this research. Then the professor at the head of it just pulls the plug, walks away. What, what's going on there? Like, where's the research? Where's the data? What have you been doing for the last few years that you've been running this thing? There's no answers. There's no, no one's like, okay, can we, can anyone, is anyone going to get to see that data? Probably not, because the people who pay for the data get to see it, but then they get to release it once that they have manipulated it in a way that they need it to be seen. And this is happening in every single sector across all of the different universities. And look at what it's creating. It's creating people who are being brainwashed and indoctrinated to, um, to certain outcomes and this belief that whatever the belief is, like, you know, it's, it's, so, it's so easily controlled. And this has been going on now for well, 1902, so over 120 years. And how do we escape this? Oh, we have to separate education from state. We have to stop giving our kids over to the beast at the age of three, four or five. In France, it's three years of age, right? Maternal starts at three, or the year you turn three. Hmm. So you might only be two, right? If, you're, if you turn three in December, the school year runs January to December. So if your birthday, if your second birthday is in December, the next year you turn three. So you are supposed to go to school. You're just two years of age. But that's what the state says. And that's what the parents depend on because they're trapped in a, uh, this hamster wheel, this race to freaking zero, competing against everybody else and just to keep a roof over their head. They need the state daycare, which is all it is, which is an indoctrination camp, because as soon as they have that two, three, four, five-year-old kid, five days a week, whatever it is, what, what, who's bringing it up? Like this is, and what's the traumatic uh, experience that that kid goes through with this, the separation from its mother? Like one day it wakes up, can play with its toys, be with its mom all day, do whatever it needs to do. The next day it's being dropped off at this like God awful looking building which is surrounded by fences and is being walked away from its parents by somebody else into a classroom with 20 freaking strangers. And like, it, what are we doing to kids? Like, this is absolutely, absolute insanity. And if you then subject them to 15 years of this, here's something that my daughter pointed out to me yesterday. And I know you'll love this one because you're French. Did you see the new laws that have come in for lycée. Okay, so when you go to a lycée or college, um, lycée is 16 to 18, right? Yeah. Yeah. You now apparently have to be on the premises between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Even if you have no lessons for three hours of that day or whatever else. Really? Yeah. You cannot get out. What is this? Like, <laughs> You're going to need to fact check my you daughter on this. You have something on your knee or right? <laughs> Absolutely. You may as well. Like this is a, a, under the guise of we want, we do, you know, the last thing we need are students out and about in the towns causing trouble. Like what are you talking about? <laughs> like, they go out and get sandwiches and they hang with their friends and they go to the cafes and then they go back and then, like, you know, what? this is complete and utter nonsense. These are internment camps at best. So if we've got to stop. So as Bitcoiners, we separate money from state. We need to separate education from state. We have to. So my, my hope is that Bitcoiners, young Bitcoiners that start in families, are going to look very closely at 
that day when it comes, do I actually want to walk my child to one of these institutions and hand them over to this, I'm sure, very nice looking teacher's assistant who's been trained, mm. who's been trained to walk that child across, even if they're crying, if the child is crying, which happens all the time, three, four, five-year-old kids cry all the time, first few weeks of school sometimes. They've been trained that, in fact, what you're doing is a good thing to walk the child away from its parent who stood, who can't cross this line because they're not allowed on the premises. Walk them away, get them into a classroom, try and settle them down, they'll be fine, it's good for them. This is complete insanity. It's, com it's, we, we, it's clown world, right? It's total inverse to what any parent could ever think would be a good thing to do to a child. Now, how do you do that? Because today it seems that to, to homeschool, you need to have a crazy salary or have uh, some reserve. Yeah. Uh, also, it seems like when I speak with uh, my friends and mostly girls, they don't want to do that. Right. Like they, they want to be free. They want to not be like enslaved by uh, their husband or those kind of things. And how do you manage to, to, to sell this view yeah. to people? Oh, it's, it's Especially girls, I, I think. Uh, today, uh, most men don't really care, I guess. They, they want also they have their child uh, protected from this system. But for me, the, the main issue is like the, the girls today. Yeah. They have been formating to not willing to do this classical way. No. And, and what has knocked that out of them? You know, their own education and their, um, their indoctrination to this idea that, uh, um, you know, this huge feminist push that has been, you know, there's an agenda. There's an agenda that gets pushed straight down through the, uh, the, the they start with the universities. Mm. Um, so I'm interested, I'm, I wonder, um, the, the girls that you've had this conversation with, have they had kids yet or they haven't had kids yet? They haven't. They haven't. No. So something fundamentally changes to a human being when you have a child. There, there's no denying that to a man and to a woman. And um, when that happens, it's indescribable. You, 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 You can't, I, I could not describe to you the change goes mentally, physiologically, the first time that, um, what you, that the whole process, the whole process just blows your mind, you know, like the, 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 the nine months of, you know, that baby growing inside another human being, like this is just absolutely nuts. And then when it's actually here and it's there and it's like your responsibility, like the, 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 the connection you feel is like nothing else. Um, so... I, it's very difficult to explain uh, to, to a, and it's obviously even bigger with a mother, it's very difficult to explain to a woman that's not been through that process uh, how she's going to feel afterwards. And I just hope that when the time comes and when they've felt that love and when they've felt that connection, when it comes to two or three years of age and they're expected, not, by the, not just by the state, but by the social construct around them, that they go and just walk them straight to the front of the gates and the career that they've built up, this fancy fiat career that they might have built up, this sunk cost fallacy that they're hanging on to, um, you know, they've been promised the promotion and all of this. And, you know, there's, there's so much psychological baggage that comes with all of that. And I, I you know, urge people to think deeply about when those days come, Like really listen to your heart, really listen to your gut. And I guarantee you, most people will see that it's, you know, a mother and a baby to be together is the most natural thing on this planet. And we're the only species that, like, can spend this long with our offspring. And yet we're, we're, we're farming that out to a state institution to people, well-intentioned people, teachers are well-intentioned people, but you have to remember that a 45-year-old teacher has been in the system for 40 years. Hmm. They've been completely conditioned. And um, the, the, the feeling of separation uh, is never repaired in the subconscious of the child. 
Uh, so, yeah, that's what, you know, it's the, that makes everything else just fall away, right? It's, oh, how am I going to do it? I'm not smart enough to teach my kids, all of this kind of stuff. That pales into comparison when you just think about like the psychological subconscious trauma that comes with, you know, what I just described. And, you know, people also get caught up in their careers. We got to remember, these are just fiat careers that like uh, we're running a thousand months. There, there are ways that you can change your life uh, and make bold decisions that feel like risky decisions to move away from like, you, you don't need to be like in a city, in an apartment. You can move further out and change your life. And I've seen, um, I, I've actually, uh, I did a, a panel about this with Pablo, Sylvia and, um, uh, who was it, Alexandra? Uh, in Bitcoin Atlantis, maybe you could link to that panel because it's, uh, it's available online. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, I will try to find it. Yeah, and uh, we, we because that's a question that comes from the audience. And um, in fact, it was nice because I didn't have to answer it. The other three did it for me. Like, okay, great. Yeah. Now it's your turn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. So for for you, whatever the the takes, no the what what is the expression? <laughs> whatever the cost is, it it will worth it. Yes. Like to, you know, yeah. that you, you, you will find, a, you will manage it, you will find a solution. 100%. That's what human beings do. We're problem solving machines. And if the, solving the problem of finding the best way uh, for you and your child to stay as a family unit for as long as possible, read Hold On to Your Kids by Gabor Mate. Read Hold On to Your Kids yeah. by Gabor Mate. And, um, or e even, there's a chapter in Seb Bunny's book, uh, The Hidden Cost of Money. There's a chapter on this exact topic. So that is the hidden cost. The hidden cost of money is a breakdown of the family unit. And there's nothing more important on this planet than like family ties and the connection that we feel with our loved ones. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> I will let you go. It was a pleasure. Thank I hope uh, people uh, will find it interesting. It will uh, resonate to people because uh, yeah, it feels like there is some missing part today uh, yeah. in our life. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Thank yeah. you for interviewing. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Appreciate it. And uh, thank you for what you do. Yeah, trying our best. <laughs>